And I want to make sure that uh, I take the appropriate time to welcome General Tex Alice that is joining us here today, who plays a critically important role in DHS. Uh, General, I know that uh, you're very busy. We really appreciate the time uh, to, to inform, to educate, and especially to pass on the challenges that DHS sees within the area of support. You as the acting uh, uh, Undersecretary for Management, the Deputy Secretary for Management, uh, these are the things that you see on an ongoing basis. So we really appreciate you taking the time being here with us today. All right. Hey, thanks, Chief. Uh, and it's uh, great to see you again, obviously, and uh, appreciate all years of, your years of service with the Border Patrol and then uh, as the commissioner there at uh, Customs and Border Protection, certainly a uh, challenging job. So uh, that's great overall. I would just mention to start that uh, it's been a uh, unusual uh, couple of years. I'm sure you all recognize that primarily focused around the pandemic and how that has changed things, not only in terms of immigration, but also in terms of uh, what's going on inside of the nation uh, and how that impacts how we uh, buy things, how we uh, uh, procure things. Uh, and I would just mention that it's also a, uh, been a dramatic impact on our workforce too, as you can imagine. Uh, uh, much of our workforce, the vast majority, uh, well over 100,000 uh, of our members are always on the front line at work every day. So, uh, and then there's, uh, of course, the office staff that uh, has been mostly doing telework, but we've seen it, uh, changed pretty dramatically as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and that's had some impact uh, on uh, how we uh, are procuring things and the kinds of things we're also procuring. Yeah, th this has really been a transformational time, I think, for, for globally in its entirety. But I think that the impact on DHS uh, and our men and women, as you say, that are out on the front lines, a dramatic impact uh, in, in how they do work. Therefore, the acquisition, therefore, the procurements and the challenges that come with it. So, General, at this point, tell us a little bit about what your top priorities are as Chief Acquisition Officer. What, what are your focuses? What are your challenges? What do you think industry needs to hear so that in any way that they can is help out? So I think our, our top priorities, uh, so we'll talk more about some of our immigration challenges, but obviously working across the border is one of our top priorities. Uh, and securing the border is a top one for us. I think also uh, a coming area we'll also talk more about is in an area of biometrics that has a, been a top priority for us. The pandemic has uh, uh, made available a lot of funding through FEMA for pandemic related events, vaccinations, testing, uh, those kinds of things have been uh, a big issue for us as has been uh, protective equipment. That has faded more over time uh, given that we can now access that more directly. Uh, so those are some of the, the things that we are thinking about in terms of our big acquisition programs. We also have a major uh, uh, recapitalization program going underway with the Coast Guard. That's uh, required a lot of uh, effort on the part of the department. Uh, they are buying a number of major ships uh, as we speak. So that's underway for them. And they've also received some, some substantial plus ups in terms of their operations and support money. Uh, and I think uh, on the uh, uh, immigration side here, integration of immigration systems is also a priority that the data we have on hand, uh, understanding what data we own, uh, what that data means, and then how we integrate that data is also a big priority for the department. So those are, those are just a few. I would also mention too, since we hit on the pandemic, that uh, our facilities are a major factor for us too. Uh, we are uh, uh, consolidating facilities. We're using less uh, commercial office space than we have been in years past. So that's another one we're seeing more of. That's not that's been a trend, not just uh, in DHS, but across government and also across the civilian sector too. So that's another one that we're looking at and how we uh, shape our workplaces uh, for the for the future. Now this here is very much focused on office workers, okay? Not the front line. The front line by and large is using the same facilities and the same operating modes with some different protocols because of COVID obviously. but uh, uh, generally, the uh, our facilities, we're looking at how we reshape those and how we organize them better uh, in terms of uh, how they, they operate for our, our personnel and then also how they uh, uh, how they protect them and uh, provide flexibility to them. And then the last thing I want to mention when we talk about priorities is always personnel, okay? Uh, without the people, it doesn't go. So uh, the human resources part, our organization is a big part of what happens here in DHS uh, as you uh, can certainly identify with 
from your past jobs. Uh, the people is what makes it go. Yeah, absolutely. The mo most important asset of our organization is our men and women out there. So, so General, you touched on immigration. That That is something that, of course, is, is being felt uh, along the entirety of DHS. One of the things uh, that, uh, that uh, I think you and I have both faced in the, in, the, in the past is that when we see an immigration ramp up, uh, on requirements at the, at the border, whether it's north, south, or maritime, or whatever. We do a very good job, DHS does a very good job of ramping up, putting forth the capabilities needed to basically stem the flow or mitigate the risk of vulnerabilities, threats associated with immigration. What happens is then, of course, there's an obvious ramp down. And then a year later, two years later, whatever it is, you have UACs, you have uh, the Hagen situation. Uh, you have the COVID-19, and there's a need to ramp up again. From a planning perspective, how do, uh, what, what is DHS looking at current requirements, which of course are massive right now, and then staying uh, prepared or at the ready for the next uh, border situation? Right. Okay. So let me cover a couple of items. One would be kind of the exigent stuff we're putting in place right now. And I'm going to talk more about acquisition programs that are priorities for us also. So with the influx, uh, we have spent a lot of money on soft sided facilities. Okay. So that's been a big focal point uh, for the department here across the, uh, across the past uh, couple of years. We have a number of them set up across the border here to process a large number of, uh, of uh, 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 immigrants crossing the uh, border here that need obviously to be processed. We're looking at ways to actually try to uh, put up more permanent facilities, okay? Because the soft side facilities are quite expensive. If we could do something on a more permanent basis, that would save us a lot of money. It's usually more time consuming uh, to get that done and can sometimes be harder to get money for them uh, just because you know they're viewed as, uh, uh, as not in use all the time. Uh, but uh, given what we've seen over the past few years, and you just highlighted it, we kind of have this up and down of immigration. They would save us a lot of money over the long term. So that would be uh, one area I think about. Uh, we also are, are in the process of putting out immigration hearing facilities uh, for this uh, migrant uh, protection protocol program that has come back by court order. So that's out there also. Uh, but those are, of course, uh, mostly temporary in basis. Longer term, as I mentioned, one is personnel. We're still actively recruiting personnel, both uh, in all our immigration spaces, uh, USCIS, Border Patrol, Field Operations, ICE, ERO, uh, all those areas that we continue to recruit in because uh, we need that manpower, obviously, to uh, uh, process uh, what we're seeing across the border. We're also uh, putting a lot of effort into surveillance. This will be obviously very familiar to you uh, because it's, uh, it's important to us. If we want to get our agents in the right place, uh, we need to know where it is that the flows are crossing. And there's Numbers of ways we've done that through the integrated fixed towers, the RVSS, remote video surveillance systems, uh, and what the, they're calling now the MVSS, mobile video surveillance systems. Uh, now we have put aircraft out for surveillance, the multi role enforcement aircraft are currently buying for Air and Marine, the Predator system that is currently uh, in use uh, along the border. So uh, the, the surveillance overall is an area that we're continuing to focus on. Uh, uh, primarily in the CBP area, but that's a big one for us there. I think also another one that we're trying to do, or we are doing more work in is, the, is, in, is in the term of terms of uh, tunneling. So uh, the subterranean threat, of course, has always been challenging. You probably remember that. We're seeing some more success there. We're also putting more effort into discovering tunnels that are crossing the border because obviously if they are undetected, they can move a large amount of drugs, the very uh, high, high quality and dangerous drugs across the border here. So those are a few that come to mind. And then finally, we're also investing in our, uh, our lift fleet. So uh, our vertical lift fleet, uh, both for our helicopters, uh, our, our small and our larger helicopters we're investing in uh, are, is another area that we're investing in, in terms of border security. Now let me transition for a second because it's not just the, uh, uh, the uh, border itself, but it's also at the ports of entry that we wanna maintain our focus too. So we are still investing in the automated commercial environment. That is still a program that's underway in field operations. And then a lot of effort is being put into non-intrusive inspections, okay? And as long as I'm on NII, and know this is not so much a border issue, obviously TSA is investing heavily in NII uh, through their 3D, uh, through their uh, CAT type of uh, 
x-rays uh, and investing in algorithms to help them better detect threats that come into airports uh, is a big focal point also. So I think we should lump that in there, though it's not exactly border issues. It is an area that we're spending a lot of money in. So uh, these NII systems uh, uh, at the ports are critical, both small scale and large scale uh, across the land, the rail, the sea environments are all, and the air environments are all critical to us in terms of uh, uh, evaluating cargo coming in and also interdicting stuff, uh, items that might be contraband. So those are a few uh, that come to mind as I think about that. Uh, and I think I should also mention too, uh, we are investing, as I mentioned, in the Coast Guard recapitalization. That does have border implications, uh, the maritime border, obviously. And likewise, we're investing in more uh, coastal interceptors for, uh, for CBP uh, on the maritime, in the maritime domain. So that's another focal point for us too. No, 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 this is exactly what uh, what I think interesting Wall Street here needs to hear. And along with that, some of the challenges, and we'll talk to some of those challenges uh, that, that I have seen in the past, that I know that you're addressing also. But you touched on something very critically important. It is the border security seems to take the most prominent position. I'm not saying it shouldn't, but along with that is the importance of everything else that you and I were involved in uh, with CBP, which is trade, the, the, the value that trade brings to our nation's economy uh, and things of that nature. So at the ports of entry, we are at a point and I think in our history that the ports of entry are so constrained physically that the major solution set is going to be all things technology, all things AI, all things machine learning, uh, edge computing, mobility, and all of these things. So if you don't mind, um, are, are, we, are we looking at growth in that area, expanding beyond that juridical line uh, we used to talk about the importance of data, of having as much data to aggregate, to, to correlate, to assess, to evaluate and act on that. What can you tell us about that expansion within the ports of entry? And by the way, TSA is, is also one of those players. Right. So one thing I would mention is we're doing a data study to figure out what our data is. OK, so we can not necessarily catalog it by individual uh, a set but all to understand where the data is, what kind of data we actually have on hand. So that's one area there. We are trying to employ more AI across our inspection systems to automate them. Another effort field operations is looking at is consolidating their, their, uh, their feeds into more centralized locations. So you're probably aware you went to many ports of entry, you go there, the NII are there and the operators right with the machine, right? So that can, that can be, uh, 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 inefficient from the standpoint that the operators, uh, you know, may have downtime. Uh, so they're looking at kind of trying to consolidate those in their more centralized facilities as an area that we could, uh, we could work at. But I do think applying AI across our inspection elements is uh, a, uh, an area we're looking at, we want to expand on because again, as you said, the more that I can automate this stuff, the more things that I can process. And there's always uh, more I can, more I need to process than I can actually process. I guess is how I would say it. I would also mention that there's more of a push to uh, to interdict outbound traffic. I'm sure you recall one of the major complaints of Mexico is outbound U.S. weapons. Okay, yes. so more effort is being put into that and to build up those outbound lanes and, and inspect them on the way out of the country. Much work to do there. Yes, a lot of work to do that. And you're right. Uh, I mean, that's a complaint we've been hearing from Mexico for, for literally decades now. And rightfully so. We need to do something about that. So, uh, and this is more of a policy issue, but certainly would affect your, your department, is the issue of, um, of sterile corridors. Uh, I talked about the ports of entry and the juridical line, but to the degree possible working with Canada, Mexico, other countries, other entities, to, to basically develop that sterile corridor, point of origin, transit, arrival, entry, and uh, point of destination by way of technology and uh, uh, certainly AI, machine learning, things of that nature. Is that, and again, I repeat myself, I know that this is kind of a policy issue, but from a um, uh, uh, acquisition procurement, are we starting to look at that alignment of uh, capabilities to build that uh, sterile corridor? So not, not so much to be honest. That's an area we probably need to do more exploration. I know policy-wise, 
we're obviously heavily engaged with both the Canadians and Mexicans in terms of talking about flow rates, uh, mainly the Mexicans about talking flow rates about across their border. And then the administration, of course, has a big focus on uh, these uh, uh, countries, uh, your Northern Triangle countries in the current situations in those countries, the economic situation, political situation, to try to uh, help improve the posture of the country itself so people are not interested in departing from the United States. But uh, we have done a little work uh, in terms of rail that I'm aware of uh, across the borders. Uh, but I think you raise a good point, which is probably something that we need to look at more uh, in a more holistic fashion. fashion. Okay. All right. And then let, let's kind of switch over, General, to all these things we've talked about, requirements, capabilities, value sets that brought to the to 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 the mission set and things of that nature. Of course, all of these are based on acquisition and procurement. Uh, improving acquisition and procurement, uh, uh, the appeals. A procurement innovation lab, uh, OTA uh, uh, implementation that has been done. And I may get this wrong, but I believe DOD, which of course is not uh, not part of what you do, DOD is talking about a, a concept called trade wins in the AI innovation to speed up, to generate uh, more capabilities on acquisition and procurement. What can you tell us about what DHS is doing to, to accelerate, uh, to modify, to bring efficiency to acquisition and procurement. So you mentioned one already, the Procurement Innovation Lab, which helps uh, actual uh, elements of DHS to streamline their procurements and make them work more uh, rapidly. Uh, I think the other parts uh, may be more considered blocking and tackling, I would say. One is, as you look at constructing an acquisition program, I don't need every acquisition program to go through all the gates that it does that could be required in our MD-102 instructions. So we try to tailor programs so we cut down on the amount of oversight needed based on the program itself. And obviously oversight costs money, it costs time. I wanna uh, get that cut down as much as possible uh, to the degree that I can. Now, obviously the IG and the GAO are very interested in our oversight functions. So I take that very seriously, but how I can tailor that down, I think is a, a key part in assuming my uh, in making my programs run more efficiently. Uh, I think also, as I think through uh, the acquisition process, I want to make sure that when I uh, uh, write a statement of work, when I put out a request for information or request for proposals, that is actually meaningful to industry. Okay, so part of that is you want to run workshops with industry. We want to get feedback on these items from industry, so we do try to do that through our procurement shop. Uh, because that obviously cuts down on another delay, which uh, uh, can be protests, and that uh, can often be structured or uh, largely revolve around how you communicate with industry in the competition phase of the actual procurement. So those are a couple of things I think that we, uh, we need to work on. So you want to really improve the process and really deliver the best solutions and improve communications with industry. So running the industry workshops, or regular industry interactions between my procurement offices and the uh, and obviously the trade uh, and industry is a key part of I think how we improve that process. Very good. And, and again, uh, absolutely remember <laughs> the pains and the trials and tribulations of figuring out how to streamline. Uh, but I think uh, we're hearing uh, uh, innovative things like the pills and OTAs and things of that nature that is uh, that is moving forward. Now, along these same lines, one of the, I guess the best way to put it on the industry side, as I understand it, uh, is uh, on the part of the IT industry relative to ATOs, uh, authorities that operate specific to cloud services providers that are, as we know, the government as a whole is moving or has moved in that direction. Uh, and the, the lack of uh, reciprocity. I mean, we had this in, in the background uh, services when, when, when you and I were working together. There was no reciprocity, so therefore there was different requirements within agencies, entities, and so forth. Are we looking to streamline any of those ATOs or get reciprocity? So there is a reciprocity uh, process through the Chief Information Officer's Office. Uh, it, uh, you know, obviously if I have software I'm running at ICE and I'm going to use it at CBP, we have, you know, I want reciprocity on that. So they are, they ha are, have worked and are working in those areas to try to ensure we can streamline that process. 
Now I would caveat that there, you know, if if I'm running a a, a service uh, on infrastructure, or actually a better example is if I'm running on the cloud and I bring it into some kind of hard infrastructure at, at a contract location, there's going to be some certification requirements that, that are involved there. But in general, the software I can, uh, if the ATOs are being run already in the department, uh, then reciprocity between the agencies should not be that much of a problem. There is a process to do that that they have in place. Uh, at the CIO's office uh, to to enable reciprocity. Now, I won't advertise it's perfect. I think it's a little bit about like uh, security clearances. Uh, depending on what the requirements are, it's going to affect uh, how much reciprocity we get between the different uh, uh, elements here. So, but there is a process out there, and I think that's important to us uh, because you know all this stuff costs money. Uh, and if I've got to go in and recertify a program, provide a new ATO for it, that's money and also it's time and effort uh, on the part of the person that's providing the software. So I think uh, I'm with you 100%. We want to continue to expand our efforts in the reciprocity area. Right, right. So in, in the in the world of procurement uh, and acquisition, but especially procurement, of course, uh, the challenges, focus, stay within budget, cost overruns, things of that nature that, that happen, with, especially with some of these large programs. Um, especially in these trying times of varying requirements and capabilities needs that we just talked about earlier. Uh, how, how do you, how does DHS stay or build the bounds and ensure that, that all of these things that if they come into play will basically extend the capability to put it in place? What 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 are the checks and balances in place? Right. So I mean, uh, you know, our all of our major acquisition programs run through what's called PON, Program Accountability and Risk Management. So they're the office that constructs all the the program timelines. They promulgate the uh, the acquisition management policies. They put out the procedures. They maintain detailed knowledge of the programs. So uh, we run a, what's called a uh, uh, acquisition review board. I chair that. And they bring the programs to the board for review. Uh, and obviously uh, that's done on purpose to progress through different milestones to authorize different levels of procurement in these particular programs. That's done through the PARM office. Uh, and it's their job to manage all of our major acquisition programs. Uh, goodness here, I'm drawing a blank because uh, I don't have the numbers right at hand of the number of programs we have, but we have quite a few major programs that basically or uh, up in the $500 billion range here that uh, Parma is overseeing here. Uh, they also uh, uh, evaluate programs in terms of uh, schedule, cost, risk, and whether the programs are breaking the thresholds. If they break the threshold, they go into breach. That means we have to go over and notify Congress and then restructure the program uh, 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 normally to uh, 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 get it out of a breach status and continue the program moving forward. So that's primarily done through the Parma office. And they run again, the, uh, we have a kind of a, a cross-functional uh, review board. Again, I said the acquisition review board. It includes our chief financial officer, our chief information officer, our chief uh, procurement officer, the chief readiness support officer who does all our analysis on, on operations. Uh, it includes the joint requirements council who develops our, our requirements, science and technology evaluation in the program itself, uh, policy, the office of policy is involved, the general counsel, and then also probably just uh, very important is our test and evaluation office, which resides over in the Senate, the, the uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, office, but uh, it does all our testing. So another key part is ensuring we have good test plans and those test plans help prove out that the item we're buying actually meets the requirements we specified for it. So those are a few of the things that we put in place. Now, there are also, uh, uh, I won't say redundant, but the, the components handle their own acquisitions too. Uh, and they have their own component acquisition officers and their own staffs that manage the, the individual programs. Uh, and I'm sure you're familiar in the Border Patrol, they manage programs, uh, your different uh, surveillance programs. Air and Marine, I was familiar with the programs that they manage. Same thing for field operations. Each person had the programs they manage. And that applies across the department here. Uh, each component has its own program management staff and their own uh, uh, component acquisition executives to evaluate how the programs are, are progressing. And then the larger programs get pulled up to the department for us to actually uh, uh, provide oversight on. I would mention that this is a critical function that G GAO and OIG wanna see in the department 
Uh, so the standup of uh, this function in management and what's called the MD 102 Management Directive 102, which is, provides our acquisition uh, frameworks and policies that they were all, uh, uh, they thought those were all important moves on the part of the, the department and actually kind of professionalizing how we do our acquisition and how we work it from requirements all the way down to the end item that we deliver. So kind of a long explanation, but that's the process we work through uh, as we look at these different major acquisition programs. Great. Right. And, and I'll tell you, it, 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 as you were talking, General, it was bringing back memories. You'll remember that one of the things that I, I believe we were successful in, uh, and you were a big part of that when we were still at CDP, was the implementation of the PPBA, what we call a PPBA, Planning Program, Budgeting, and right. Accountability uh, Program. I, one of the most challenging ones that we had within CDP, and I can only imagine what it is at the DHS level, was uh the what you all taught me was the JROC, joint requirements oversight council i know it's named something else now joint requirements council i believe right uh dhs level C can you give us uh, a snapshot of how that works for the department yeah the jrc is hand is uh is uh, uh uh is headed by obviously a senior ses the current one is joe Warrow, who's a retired army colonel very familiar with requirements so the idea of the jrc before the JRC, components decided what they would want to buy. They weren't necessarily uh, developing a strict set of requirements to uh, work against. And so you could often uh, wind up with products that uh, didn't really fit, fit your mission needs. And without getting too specific, I'll just mention an Air Marine. I know we had bought some helicopters that did not meet our mission needs well because the requirements weren't well defined. They weren't tested well. So the JRC helps, not only helps, it is the mechanism to develop requirements, vet them through the component and the department that they are valid requirements so that we can actually develop specifications to buy against uh, as we go forward to industry and advertise the products. So that's how it works. It's a key part of what we do. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, very important uh, to the acquisition program that we have good solid requirements moving into that program. So we can kind of trace it down all the way to what we tell industry you want to buy and then how we're going to test it and validate. It actually delivers as uh, what we asked it to deliver. Great, good. I, I think that's an important aspect for industry to understand how, 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 how that builds up to what we actually acquire and, and procure. So, General, we've got about uh, probably about four more minutes, uh, and and I'd like for you to kind of be thinking as to what else you think you may we may need to be hearing. I'm going to pose one more question, and then I'll turn it over back to you. Okay. Uh, but the question, and 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 you literally started off with the importance of uh, the men and women. Uh, challenging times, COVID nineteen, uh, all the surges that are happening, uh, and things of that nature. What is DHS doing? to ensure the healthy to the to the health of, of our men and women what 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 are we focusing on uh for health wise for our men and women so i uh so in terms of the pandemic obviously you're aware there's an executive order out for the vaccinations okay that does also affect industry that's being written to the new contracts as industry is probably aware i'm sure i'm sure my cpo is telling industry that so that's one area that we're trying to tamp down uh, uh, disease uh, across the department. We have put more, uh, each component now has a medical doctor that's part of that. And while we're not expressly uh, 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 responsible for healthcare, we do have a better support structure in place, what we call our employee assistance program. You may be aware of that from Border Patrol. Border Patrol was kind of the model, I think, for the department and how employees were assisted in tragic situations. Uh, you know, whether they had a death in the family, whether we had an agent die in the line of duty on, uh, on, uh, uh, at work, how we protected employees, uh, you know, providing protective equipment, making sure they have the right equipment on board, you know, all those fit into that kind of uh, employee uh, morale protection uh, safety program that we have in place. And so we, we want to put actually more effort into that. Uh, that particular area, the EAP thing, I think is more uneven across the department. Uh, I think it could use improvement in various areas of our components uh, uh, as opposed, I mean, CVP is one of our stronger ones, I think, in terms of that area. And I don't find it to be as even across the department. It's one of the concerns of our Chico, Angie Bailey, has been 
how does the employee assistant program uh, uh, pro works across the department and how, how to make that more even and take care of our employees better. So that is a key focus for us. Very good. Well, General, we've covered a lot of area. Uh, uh, anything else that you would share with, uh, with the audience here that you'd like for them to hear? Yeah, I would just uh, go back to my original comments here. I think uh, it's been a challenging time. I think uh, I tell my executives, the ones that are interfacing with industry, I want to maintain good communication with industry. That's important to us. I think uh, even going back to a World War II example, uh, really being successful is having good communication between the government and industry as we work through these different issues uh, and work through these different programs. So that would be the key part. And I, I'm trying to maintain open lines of communication between the department, primarily through our procurement offices, to industries, we lay out requirements that we need to do to move the department and the nation forward. Very good. General, once again, I, I, I want to thank you for spending the time with us. Uh, I'm going to do this in a little bit of reverse order. Uh, and that is basically recognizing you for the outstanding service that you're doing, carrying out now, but also recognizing the fact that you've been the uh, uh, Deputy Undersecretary of Management for over two years now, I believe, maybe actually going on three, I guess. Uh, uh, you're, you've been the 25th Director of the U.S. Secret Service. Uh, you were the Deputy Commissioner for Customs and Border Protection. You were the Executive Associate Commissioner for, uh, for Mission Support or Enterprise Services. Uh, and then you and I, I had the pleasure of working with you when you were the EAC and Director of Air and Marine. Truly appreciate all the service. And the one recognition that I will give you, of course, is Major General Marine Corps, which I'm absolutely sure that you're very proud of. And that's something that I am very proud to state right now, fellow Texan. <laughs> that, that, is, uh, that was something that when we first communicated struck me as, as just an outstanding part of a gentleman that has spent as much time in service to, uh, to our country. And the fact that we, uh, that we served our country together as fellow Texans in these critically important positions. Thank you for that, really appreciate it. Well, Chief, thank you so much for that. For that. And I appreciate your service too, obviously many, many years of government service in difficult uh, circumstances. I think we should just conclude with recognizing uh, our employees at DHS, the sacrifices they make day to day uh, those particularly on the front line, our law enforcement officers, I just think it's outstanding. I can't say enough good things about what they do for us personally and also for our nation. So uh, my hat's off to them. And thanks for the time. Good. Everyone. Couldn't agree more, General. Our salute to our men and women. Thank you. Thank you.